Yes, dear Miriam, dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm a little bit embarrassed because of this famous hospitality here in Tel Aviv at your university. It's, it's a, a great moment. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, just one word more. This GIF or the GIF project, it's firstly, it's really, it's firstly Miriam's project. She, uh, it's an initiative of Miriam and I'm just somebody who is as astonishing, astonishing, uh, is, is, uh, um, uh, yeah, Sorry. yeah, that's all I can say. Um, thank you for that too. And one little word more, um, Miriam told you that I'm the director of the Duke August Library. Perhaps you know the Duke August Library um, has a very elaborated a fellowship program. It, we have fellowships for students, for PhD candidates. We have fellowships for um, professors and so on. And I just can say you have to apply for a fellowship. But I just can say do it. Uh, I would like to see you in Wolfenbüttel. Peter, you don't have to say that to Israelis. When we invite them, they come. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I hope so. I would be happy. So we have all these people coming to your... <laughs> um, the invention of purity, my subject, has nothing or not really nothing to do with our project. But it, uh, I, I think it's a good subject because it shows what I think historical anthropology could be. Yeah. And so, I, I, and that's one aspect. The second aspect is perhaps it's not, it's, it's more or less interesting for you to hear something about purity. My first point, prologue. When in the summer of 1480, a Turkish fleet landed in Apulia, sparking a wave of panic across Italy. The D Dominican monk, Georg von Ungarn, decided to put pen to paper in Rome and recorded the story of his 20-year imprisonment in the Ottoman Empire. The book he wrote was published in the following year without naming its author, and bore the title Tractatus de Moribus Condictionibus et Nequitia Turcorum. This was reprinted and translated repeatedly over the coming decades. For some example, in 1530, as chronicle and description of Turkey with an introduction by Martin Luther. Also, Georg certainly intended his Tractatus to be an account of suffering during the course of which he made eight attempts to escape. He also makes it clear to his readers that the empire of evil is a very orderly place. Virtue and discipline prevail here. People here know to hold their tongues when there is a need to be quiet. Above all, though, this is where purity in the sense of puritas reigns. Whether at home or on the streets outside, the Turks' <coughs> devotion to purity is so great that they suspect almost all every day's objects along with almost every activity of being impure. If they are planning to eat a chicken, they feed it for a whole week 
exclusively with pure corn, despite the fact that they bleed it fully after slaughter. If they want to pray, they make sure they are physically immaculate, immaculate whereby they distinguish between three libations, lotiones. Georg dedicates an entire section of his book to this. Although this by no means constitutes the complete tableau of Turkish virtues described in Tractatus, in the Tractatus. One question can be put off no longer. Was someone looking to risk his life 30 years after the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople? Or more specifically, was the Dominican Georg von Ungarn not familiar with Paul's words that unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure? It should no, not surprise anyone to learn that Georg von Ungarn was indeed familiar with the words, although he reveals his, this only towards the end of his observations, thereby making his Tractatus part of the ongoing Turkish peril discourse that had colored Western European perceptions of the Ottoman Empire since the mid-15th century. The purity of the Turks, according to Georg, is merely a superficial purity, a ruse of the devil that moreover serves to lead Christians astray and away from the true faith at the end of time. For, if I may translate, quote, however perfect the external morals may be, if they arise out of a corrupt, impure, and carnal driving force, then they are vexatious." Unquote. My second point, purity as a cultural code. I have to confess, the first time I read the Tractatus, I almost skimmed over these particular passages. Perhaps because I believed they had little to do with my interest in the political anthropology of intercultural encounters. Perhaps also because I had the impression, albeit from an unaccustomed perspective, that this was confirmation of the medical history credo that the end of the late medieval bathing house culture in Europe gave way to a hydrophobic epoch, an epoch that was characterized by relentless warnings about the dire consequences of over-frequent cleansing, cleansing of the body using water. Incidentally, even the Encyclopédie defined douche as a term de chirurgie, and there is much to suggest that even the regular cleansing of the bourgeois body in the 19th century become established only through the gradual reorganization, or perhaps we should say the purification of public space. At the same time, however, I noted that later Western reports from the Ottoman Empire also frequently touched upon the subject of the Turks' preoccupation with cleanliness. These likewise endeavored to demonstrate that this purity actually constituted impurity. I asked myself against this backdrop, the backdrop of narratives that more or less openly and over a lengthy period of time provided a setting for the discourse of purity or impurity, 
whether there wasn't more going on here than I had originally assumed, or to be precise, whether it is possible to argue that discourse serves to appraise a terrain of ambiguity for what is the intercultural encounter, while at the same time delimiting this. For even my fleeting glimpse of the reports had been enough for me to realize whosoever enters a terrain of this nature is in danger of losing their way, of losing their way. Milestones are required. I decided to widen the scope of my textual sources and also began exploring English, French, and Italian reports. I attempted to come straight to the abstract point of what was presented. I would like to set out three findings of my semantically and methodologically open, or at least independent, studies. My first point, purity requires impurity. Without impurity, there can be no purity. However, the reverse also applies. Without purity, there can be no impurity. Whosoever aspires to be pure most must consign others to a state of impurity. Yet this also means purity and impurity, to paraphrase Reinhard Kozalek in the sense of a semantic of shifting historical experience, are binary terms that claim universal, universality. As asymmetrically opposing terms, these seek to exclude reciprocal recognition. For this reason, whosoever speaks of purity consequently also expresses identities and alterities. My second observation or finding, purity serves to bring perceptions into line and to unify experiences. And by this means to homogenize, stabilize, and ultimately also harmonize interpretations of self and the world. For this, reasons, this reason, concepts of purity are also always concepts of the proper order of things, wholly within the meaning of Mary Douglas' epochal study, Purity and Danger, first published, published in 1966, which addresses this relationship from the perspective of impurity, whereby impurity was rigorously identified as matter out of place. Perhaps you know this famous sentence, shoes are not dirty in themself, themselves, but it is dirty to place them on the dining table. My third finding, purity draws boundaries, boundaries between religious, social, and ethnic groups, boundaries between yesterday and today, boundaries between man and woman, boundaries between human and unhuman, to use a term that is not infrequently encountered in the travelogues. This consequently means whosoever endeavors to reconstruct concepts of purity is also, also always tracing demarca demarcation processes, processes of making differences, which for their part reveal who has power, or to be precise, interpretive, interpretive power within the context of a prevailing collective classification system over truths and untruths, over holy and unholy, and thus 
frequently also the power define, to define value and non-value. If one, that was my third finding. If one, at, one attempts to draw these results together conceptually, then it is possible to state whosoever explores concepts of purity and impurity is exploring an exclusive pattern of meaningfully interpreting the world that by promoting order, generating symbols and guiding actions serves to transport ambiguity into unambiguity in accordance with a pattern that I would like to call a cultural code. Perhaps you know, surely you know the famous book, uh, Antisemitism as a Cultural Code, and I took this word, um, and not by accident. I would like to call a cu cultural code. I come to my third point, the white ribbon. Although this attempted systemization would certainly have enabled me to pursue my project of a political anthropology of intercultural encounters, within the context of a lecture, I took the decision to go down a different path moving beyond the subject of East-West cultural contacts to explore the place of that exclusive pattern of meaningfully interpre interpreting the world during the European early modern era. I was, I was and I am, however, firmly convinced that purity can still be discovered du during this supposedly hydrophobic epoch in the form of a cultural code. Moreover, the more frequently, the more clearly this code was used in Western reports from the Ottoman Empire, including in the long durée, the more emphatically I felt myself being addressed not so much as a historian of the early modern era, but instead as a historical anthropologist. For one thing is clear, however one grasps purity as a day-to-day -day practice and body language, as an ethos, cult, and ritual, as a medium used to inter interpret self and the world, it is a historical anthropologic an anthropological term, challenge par excellence and consequently an opportunity to get to the crux of the early modern era in historical anthropological terms. One may ask, for example, whether the obsessive orderliness that ever since Lucien Fevre has often been said to characterize this epoch abides by the code of purity that, like the white ribbon in Michael Haneke's film of the same name, mercilessly warns and threatens demonstrative, mistrustful, alternately appraising and stigmatizing and gets under the skin to an extent that is difficult to underestimate underestimate. And in this conjunction, it is also judicious to involve those canonized processes and concepts of social and denominational disciplining without which it would be impossible to imagine the early modern era. However, this all also means, even if it is indeed the case that the late medieval centuries were the dirtiest in the history of Europe, as Catherine Eschenberg once declared from a historical 
hygiene perspective, then this is certainly non-irreconcilable with the search for purity in the early modern era. Indeed, one might even say, on the contrary, if it is safe to assume that the dirt in the history of hygiene and medicine can be traced back to precisely those concepts of purity we are currently examining. At any rate, my hypothesis in a nutshell is purity as a cultural code is an invention of the European early modern era, or expressed slightly differently, it is only in the early modern era that purity becomes the white ribbon that points orderliness in the right direction. The next point, take off. Having hurried from Wartburg Castle to Wittenberg in order to put his colleague Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt liturgically in his place, on March 13, 1522, Martin Luther held a sermon of the sacrament within the framework of his Invocavit sermons. Quote, you have heard, he declared, how I preached against the Pope's foolish laws and opposed his edicts, that no woman shall wash the altar clothes upon which the host does lie, not even a poor nun. It must be washed by a pure priest. And if a person does touch the host, the priest shall come and cut off his finger and many other matters of this nature. We have preached against such foolish edicts and disclosed them. By this means we have demonstrated that whosoever breaches the foolish papal laws and edicts commits no sin and that a lay person does not sin if he touches the host with his hands." Unquote. The criticism we find in this excerpt from a sermon is directed towards the liturgical insistence that only pure hands may perform sacred acts. Drawing upon Old Testament concepts of pollutio, under which flows of blood and semen, as well as certain foodstuffs, were impure and consequently hindered participation in sacred rituals. It is essentially the case that such demands la lapsed with Jesus and are not likely to have played a significant role in early Christianity. Dur during the course of the Middle Ages, they, began, they again began to acquire liturgical significance. At the Reformation Monastery of Cluny, for example, they appear to have been observed with obsessive zeal. Arnold Ang Angenand, a church historian, has repeatedly pointed out that the Polluzio concepts and their implementation helped drive a wedge between the clergy and the laity thus jeopardizing the commensality of the sacrament. And in view of the quantitative, quantitatively increasing piety of the laity during the late Middle Ages, there's much to suggest that it was precisely these, this experience that led to tangible erosion or the radicalization of the principle of ritual purity in the 14th and 15th centuries. Incidentally, if the Dominican Georg von Ungarn never tired of describing 
the Turkish lotiones, then this might have something to do with the fact that he was well aware of this process of erosion. However, what does this mean for the notion that purity as a cultural code is an invention of the early modern era? Although little is known in the modern era about separate pollutio concepts and pollutio practices, I am nevertheless confident that I have been able to make an observation. The erosion of the principle of ritual purity is closely linked to the victory march of the principle of ethical purity. It is not that this principle was forgotten during the Middle Ages, and it is not that only groups such as the Qatars based their criticism of ritual purity on references to Matthew 15, Mark 7, which addressed the purity or impurity of the heart. However, the discursive profile above in conjunction with the socially effective revitalization of New Testament concepts of purity began to gather pace only during the course of the 15th century. This was not least because it was powerfully interpretive and broadly anti-clerical and developed into one of the dynamic and constitutive driving forces behind the process of aligning religion and society. Bernd Hamm, an other German uh, church historian, called this normative. Ultim ultimately, it led to the invigorating Reformation and post-Reformation association between pure word, pure teaching, and pure life. To be precise, while at the same time returning to Martin Luther. It is not necessary to stress at the present juncture that the great reformer was hardly criticizing the call of ritual purity in order to cause this to be replaced by demands of ethical purity. Far from it, for this was certainly not his objective. He was not arguing that the effectiveness of the sacraments and thus, thus the proclamation and ascertainment of pure word and pure teaching was contingent upon morally impeccable, pure human conduct. After all, the fall, the so-called Sündenfall, the fall made any such contingent link impossible. In a sermon of the married state of January 1519, for example, he declared, quote, for if one is looking for purity and chastity such as character characterizes the angels, one will find, one, one will find that nowhere, neither in the state of matrimony nor outside marriage in the state of virginity. On the other hand, Luther repeatedly stressed, and this is where ethical purity comes into play, that the quasi external purity transferred at the moment of baptism needs to be understood above all as a task and duty to become pure. This is exactly what is meant by the communication of the pure word. Within the context, I return to the marriage sermon of January 1590. In this, Luther, having endeavored to convince his audience of the impurity of marriage after the fall, defiantly declares Quote, nevertheless, one must work and act to make this pure, unquote. In other words, Luther defines purity as 
and unequal equivocally and all enveloping quality given by God through baptism and the word. At the same time, the aim is to persuade per people of their moral obligation to achieve purity without their ever being able to satisfy this obligation during their lifetimes. Yet, this also means while Luther consistently emphasizes that no spiritual or temporal order is able to restore the lost purity of heart and body, he also stresses that moral perfection is possible as a moral obligation of the process of attaining purity. He states that institutional forms of living can contribute towards this process of achieving perfection. Marriage first and foremost. For it is not merely the case that marriage is is <coughs> divinely ordained in contrast to the ascetic repudi repudiation of sexuality that is a prerequisite for ritual purity. It also has the force to make the impure thoughts, impure words, and impure actions of spouses, aside from adultery, sufficiently pure that God is able to forgive all. God shields everything with heaven, as the, the cited sermon of August 1545 unequivocally states, for, quote, this impurity, says the Lord, I do not wish to see, unquote. My next point, a great monastery. Let me make it clear, there are good reasons to attribute the exercisation <coughs> of purity to the ton de reform that Heinz Schilling, not least, repeatedly qualified as a protracted threshold age. It was during the course of the threshold age that the Societas Christiana was transformed into the multi-denominational society of the early modern age. However, I nevertheless take the view that ethical purity, in an epochal sense, actually took off with Martin Luther. This, above all, becomes it see, because it seems that Luther's definition of purity, constituting a moral obligation to become pure, put in a nutshell what, in a manner of speaking, lay in the air. What other speakers were also articulating, or at least attempting to articulate. What, to mention just one particularly high profile example, was meant by Erasmus of Rotterdam, when in 1518, in a letter, he imagined Kivitas as a magnum monasterium. He was certainly not referring primarily to the principle of ritual purity. In modern terms, one could also argue Luther's definition was crossing all dogmatic rifts, socially and politically compatible, and even anthropologically acceptable. Moreover, Luther's definition compressed and galvanized all those cultural trends that from the late Middle Ages onwards had been endeavoring to reconfigure the societas humana. Once again, I would like to state it is certainly possible to emphasize the role played by the Reformation as a catalyzer of ethical purity. Yet, whatever perspective one takes, what we are able to observe since the trans transition from the 15th to the 16th century is a remarkable 
flourishing of purity discourses, purity models, and purity practices. To be precise, whenever the relationship between sexes, marriage, love, sexuality, children, or divorce is addressed, the issue at stake is purity and impurity. Whenever public bases were shut down during this period, up to the year 1534 in Vienna, for example, the number declined within a few decades from 21 to 11. The authorities cited the danger of syphilis, thus bringing an illness into play that combined internal as well ex as external impurity. Whenever attention focused on prostitution during the, this per period, and attention increasingly focused on this issue from the turn of the century to onwards, the very same authorities no longer judge the pros and contras in the manner of the late Middle Ages in terms of public order criteria, but instead, instead against the backdrop of the notion that puritas vitae and puritas civitatis are in fact one and the same. This also means, however, that during the course of the 16th century, they steadily shut down the so-called Frauenhäuser, as brothels tended to be called in 16th century Germany. Wittenberg led the way in 1522. Other cities that had become Protestant soon followed Sweet. Erfurt, for example, in 1525. Constance in 1526. This triggered an upsurge in such bands across the whole of Europe. It even gradually spread to traditionally Catholic municipalities and territories. In due course, sermons, teachings, and not least poetry emphasized the purity of what was being said in the respective category. For however pertinent, the reformers strove to be with their cult of words even a cursory glance at Catholic sermons in the 16th century and thereafter clearly shows that these two cited the purity of language and creed. Catholic articulacy, or what is was, or as it was increasingly called from the 17th, 17th century onwards, eloquence now followed the cultural code of purity. My sixth point, highlighting differences. This was not a flash in the pan. It did not end with the new morality of the Reformation. On the contrary, the victory march of ethical purity continued and even gathered place, pace. After all, during the course of the 17th century, the matrix of pure and impure also began to structure the deep-seated process characteristic of the early modern age that we know as confessionalization. This had a reciprocally energizing effect. It is even possible to say the question of the origins and profile of dem denominational cultures is also always a question of drawing boundaries between pure and impure, or to put it bluntly, confessionalization was purification, and consequently, at the same time, its opposite. What did this mean in concrete terms? It meant that Catholics and Protestants alike redesigned their church spaces. This was indeed an attempt to comprehensively reconfigure 
objects and meanings to use the language of postmodern spatial sociology. Or it meant that saints were likely to find themselves relocated to the margins or behind the pillars of heavenly society if they weren't removed from this entirely. In addition, the recruitment process became much tougher. Even Mary herself was not exempt, exempted from purifying campaigns. Even during the 17th century, the mother of God was only permitted to be pregnant if she was wearing a capacious cloak. It meant that people throughout Europe assumed as a matter of course that other faith communities were pathogenic. And it meant that there was also widespread and increasing fear of contamination of holy texts and consequently fear of contamination of doctrine and faith. Examples may be found in Luther's so-called Jewish, Jewish writings as well as in the work of the G Jesuit Bolondists. This means that processes of denominational differentiation all the way up to the denominational divide need to be understood more or less universally as processes during which boundaries were drawn between pure and impure and were also repeatedly staged as such. This means that church discipline, which with its sometimes harsh prohibitions, played an increasingly important role in these processes. Anabaptism and Calvinism, and not least Lutheran pietism, had above all one goal, the purity of the Eucharistic congregation. After all, and I hardly need to stress this point, the purity of word and the purity of doctrine drew all of these movements much more strongly together to the Puritas Vitae than Martin Luther had done. By the way, this also means that we, it seems, can identify comparable developments in Jewish diaspora communities in Europe. However, it is important to remember the denominational or confessionalized violence of the early modern era also adhered to the cultural code of purity. Here, too, confessionalization constituted purification. Back in 1973, Natalie Zeman Davis was able to demonstrate this, drawing upon the example of rights of violence during the French Wars of Religious Religion. In the in interim, this has been confirmed on numerous occasions. Whether victims were mocked and ridiculed, ridiculed whether tortured, raped, or executed, whether corpses were desecrated, the purpose was always to make purity and impurity physically apparent and consequently identifiable. It is also po possible to state that the rights of denominational violence were intended to establish unambiguity. It was precisely for this reason that when the tables were turned, the respective other side was able to make effective use such phenomena for their own propaganda purposes. My seventh point, good blood, bad blood. <coughs> 
On the 5th of June, 1449, the Municipal Council of Toledo issued a statute declaring all conversos, all converted Jews and their Christian descendants, in the language of the edict, todos descendientes del perver perverso linaje de los judíos, to be without honor, without competence, and unworthy of holding a position in the city or in its environs, irrespective of whether this was public or private. Also, the statute triggered fierce controversy, and while it is doubtful if it ever became res judicata, it nevertheless became a model for other public authorities throughout Spain. Soon thereafter, other cities and regions, along with knightly and mendicant orders, cathedral chapters and universities, likewise issued edicts with the same or similar wordings. In the 15th century, the rules were widened to include converts of Muslim origin, so-called Moriscos. Enjoying papal as well as royal approval from the 16th century onwards, the statutes remained in force essentially until 1833. While their effect differed, and however disparately their interpretive power may be gauged, it is clear that the statutes were an extremely effective means of disseminating and institu institutionalizing a concept that contemporaries called limpieza de sangre, the purity of blood, a concept that aimed primarily to enable the scope of ecclesiastical heresy laws to be widened to include the descendants of converted Jews and Muslims. On the one hand, this equated apostasy and heresy, and on the other, contrary to the Pauline principle of equality before God within the Christian faith, assumed that heretical propensities were inherited through blood. Quite simply, this ignored the meaning of baptism. It was moreover a notion that anthropologized a concept. A concept. With its new meaning, it popularized a term that until the, uh, the transition from the 15th to the 17th century had been used more or less exclusively to describe the lineage of dogs and horses, the term rasa, race. To quote from a passage on Jews and conversos in the Historia de la Vida of Charles V by Fray Prudencio de Sandoval, published in 1604, if I may translate, quote, where there is one person of such poor origins, the tan mala rasa, they exist in large numbers. For this race, esta gente, is of such wicked nature that one suffices to unsettled many. Who can deny that the descendants of the Jews retain and preserve the evil inclinations of ageless ingratitude and lack of insight, as the blacks retain the inseparable, inse, inseparable characteristic of their black skin. Even if these come together a thousand times with white women, their sons will be born with the black color of their fathers. For it is not enough for a Jew to be three quarters aristocrat or ancient Christian, 
as one quarter of his origin rather infects him to such an extent that he damages any community in every way imaginable." Unquote. It needs to be stressed once again, there were also figures who objected such to such positions. Nevertheless, the trend towards naturalizing heresy gathered pace in Spain during the early modern era. It found wide-ranging legal canonization in Juan Escobar del Coro's influential tractatus Bi Partibus de Puritate et Nobilitate Probanda of 1637. This was more radical than anything that had been published before. Above all, it also applied the heresy of Jewish converts to the ante, so-called antenati, that is to say, to the sons who had been bor born before the baptism of the father. It was argued that it is not the influence of the heresy that causes the propensitive, the naturalis propensionis, which are then passed to the sons through heretically contaminant blood. Instead, it was the propensities that turns, turned Jewish converts into heretics, that inexorably turned them into heretics. These propensities were also expressed in the ante, so-called antenati. With this, the ecclesiastical lawyer and inquisitor del Coro firmly opposed the distinction that was usually drawn between antenati and postnati. Furthermore, it also helped to push, to push into the background the concept, still widespread even in Spain at this time, that heresy was first and foremost an intellectual crime. Scholars have frequently argued that this, this was a specifically, a specifically Spanish phenomenon, and that this was a direct result of the forced mass baptisms of Jews and Muslims between the 15th, uh, 14th and the 15th centuries. There is certainly some truth in this. For conversos in particular, these mass baptisms opened up social, economic, and ultimately political opportunities. Many conversos were successfully able to seize these opportunities. It was perhaps inevitable that tensions arose with the Christianos naturalis. Mass baptism also destabilized those established ethno-religious certainty that, as guarantors of social and cultural order, were seemingly of tremendous integrative importance in Spain in the early modern era. This applied in particular to the lower, lower strata of the population. At any rate, it does not appear to be a mere coincidence that one of the pro protagonists of the Limpieza de Sangre was the arch Archbishop of, Tole of Toledo, Juan Martinez Silesio. He, he was of passion stock. Unlike the members of, a, of the arist aristocracy, peasants rarely entered into family relationships with conversos. For social and economic reasons, moreover, they were rarely able to. At the same time, however, it should be noted that it is not merely in the Spain of the late Middle Ages and early modern age that we are able to observe an increasing trend towards the naturalization or biologization of ancestry. Furthermore, it is by no means only in Spain that this trend began to be articulated through an 
anthropologized concept of race. There is absolutely no question, for example, that disputes between the French noblesse d'épée and noblesse d'Europe during the early modern era were associated with heated debates about purity and race. This led, on the one hand, to a veritable cult of the pure-blooded bon race, bon race, and on the other, to an erosion of perhaps transformation of arist aristocratic models of virtue. This also applied to biblical teachings on the subject of ancestry that had set the tone in the Middle Ages. In his writings on the noblesse de France, the historian Henri de Boulainvilliers divided the French population into a race conquérante et patricienne of Frankish stock and a Gallo-Roman race conquise et plebeienne. In structural terms, the arguments he put forward to this classification were virtually identical to those of Silicio or Del Coro, which in the mid 19th, 19th century incidentally made it easy for the self proclaimed Comte Gobineau to allude to his ancient and noble compatriot. Conclusion. It would be difficult to analyze the process of naturalization more closely and in a more differentiated manner. Whether in the form of digression on Luther's utterances on nature, blood, and flesh of the Jews, or in the form of an attempt to reconstruct the discourses of skin color that were associated with this process, not least within the context of the European expansion, or in discussions of Jewish concepts of ethno-religious purity, such as were articulated in the mid-17th century when news spread that descendants of the 10 lost tribes of Israel had been discovered in the Andes. It would also be possible to con continue the process over a longer time frame, observing how this led to the race theories of the 18th century and contributed towards the shift from early modern gene genealogical racism to, the, to today's anthropological racism. At the same time, time, it would also be possible to ask what's the role, what role the process played in the emergent, emergence of welfare state concepts that aimed to detoxify the body politic in order, in the sense of the population imperative, to improve collective fertility. And in this conjunction proposed measures that may indeed be called proto-eugenic. And finally, it might also be possible to hunt for traces of this process in European colonies, for example, in South and Central America. It was here that concepts of blood purity were used to exclude indigenous new Christians from the priesthood. Yet, at the same time, such concepts also accompanied the emergence of new, or perhaps rather new old elites. If I nevertheless wish and am able to reach this conclusion, then this is because it would only confirm how closely the early modern era's trends towards naturalizing ancestry and consequently purity was associated with a breakthrough of the principle of ethical purity, or to be precise, with a confessionalization and ultimately the nationalization and 
incorporation of the principle in the welfare state, to put it blunt bluntly, the thesis that purity as a cultural code was an invention of the early modern era refers precisely to these processes of internal and external demarcation that strove to create above all one thing, ambiguity. Yet this also means if it is indeed the case that concepts of purity were concentrated above all in places where collective affiliations were in jeopardy, then it seems to me that the preoccupation with purity that is observable in the early modern era was nothing if not consistent. For there is much to suggest that the specific dynamism of this epoch was brought about by the fundamental collective experience of ongoing dislimitation, not least geographical. An experience that engendered the desire for order that the matrix of pure and impure endeavored to put right. Is the early modern era is the European early modern era therefore a pattern book of the modern age? I don't think so. However, it contains all, all one needs to become, imp to become pure and in particular to cause others to become impure. Thank you very much. Maybe we will let one question to Don. No, you want to ask something? <laughs> well, that, yeah. It's the intellectual of, the, of our department. No, no, no. <laughs> just, just because I, I did with the conversos. My point is just the following. I think that the, the point you, you, you show is that the individuality, what, what a person is in terms of individual and the groups, becomes to be perceived as a matter which departs from the inner to the outer. And this is, has much to do with two paths. On the one hand, the idea of virtue and purity, which is what you mentioned at the beginning of Luther, and, and which is a Paulinian idea, kind of from within, and the other of blood. And blood has to do with the humors. And, uh, and in fact, there is no only way to theologically thinking about uh, racism. But in fact, this interiority entails a profound debate. If we are the outcome of our interiority, where is to be placed? In our synthesis, in our conscious, or in our blood? And this is very important because blood, blood and I, I'm finishing with that, blood, according to the early modern and late medieval medical perception, is the way where you transmit in the more profound and strong way the characteristic of your forefathers. And then, then therefore, it's much complex than to say that the, the, even if the Jews receive the pap, the pap Baptizing, there should not be uh, uh, accepted is be because inside the discourse of blood within nobility they justify the fact that they could be Christian with noble blood and Christian with non noble and plebeian blood and the same went in Spain and Portugal with the Jews they received the baptism like also black people but this doesn't necessarily meant that they will become equal. They could be placed according to their so-called or purported uh, characteristics because they, they were received from blood and, and blood is a, was a very complex idea concerning uh, you know, lineage and, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Mr. Sinek.
Thank you. Yeah. If just one word that I I did it a little bit too, I don't know, dichotomic, yes? Because there is a connection between blood and virtue. Yes. But the, the question is, um, that there is, on the other hand, a strong tendency in the 15th and 16th century that, that, that there is a, it's, it's, it's more, A decrease of the imagination of a virtue, um, this this connection between virtue and blood, and on the, in this, in the, in the same moment, blood as a more or less neutral thing be, became uh, more important. With all possibility and possibilities, I, I, I hope to have um, demonstrated. Now I have a problem. I have to write my last book once again because I think that I should have used your <laughs> your concept of purity. So, what am I going to do? I'm going to do so now you know why you blame because you are going to get a superb gift from my London University. I, or I have to ask what it is because it's for, they told me it's for your telephone. Oh, yeah. So we will discover that. I don't know if it's pure or not. But you. <laughs>